Hey. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah. My name is Markus Vervier. Um, yeah. I'm a security generalist. Uh, in my day work, I'm responsible for managing two companies, one in Belgium and one in Germany, two European spirit. Um, my main occupation is yeah, managing things and code review. I mean, sometimes I can do some research still, uh, like this one I want to present today. And I want to talk about eSIM, which, uh, yeah, is a kind of recent technology. And the, the whole journey started with an idea about using eSIM as a C2 channel. Yeah, yet another C2. We were talking about C2s and, yeah, C2 seems to be always a variation of obfuscation techniques nowadays. But so we were thinking like, could eSIM maybe be a kind of out of band channel, right? So because it's having a separate network connection from, uh, yeah, the usual one. And um, so I started investigating the eSIM technology stack, and uh, that shouldn't be that complex, right? So um, <laughs> we need to know what, like, what permissions are required to provision the eSIM, uh, yeah, what, what permissions are required to actually use it, and uh, who does actually implement eSIM and how. And I started looking into that, so I found a lot of stuff uh, from profile provisioning to the actual security to the host operating systems and applications. And I found this, this topic is so complex. Uh, so yeah, everything, everywhere, all at once. And too many tabs. So this talk is not, let's say... Um, a hardcore uh, explanation of the eSIM protocols and everything, because that would take some days. And uh, there are other talks in the nitty gritty details. Um, I want to show the offensive perspective. So I want to see, like, from an offensive mindset, like, how does eSIM actually work? Uh, what's the attack surface that the X system brings that wasn't there before? And how can eSIM be used for offensive operations? And of course, if you're a defender, what does it mean for you? Uh, what are new threats? And, um, yeah, so eSIM features, I mean, it's basically a kind of virtualized SIM card. Uh, the classic SIM card is a physical device. Um, this is now a kind of virtualized one, and it is fl very flexible. You can have multiple eSIMs on your phone or on your device, and um, uh, you can have it from multiple providers, right? So also good for smaller devices, variables, um, and yeah, should allow mobile connectivity. Um, the security concerns are similar to mostly to the old uh, style, like SIM card, like data privacy, unauthorized access to the network, uh, especially relevant for the providers. Cloning and spoofing shouldn't be possible, so you shouldn't be able to copy the eSIM and use the same con mobile contract multiple devices, right, paying once. Um, any other fraudulent uh, activities and compromise. So a uh, new is actually the remote provisioning and management capabilities because you need to manage the eSIMs and um, help you maintain control over the profiles uh, from the provider side. Um, yeah, when I say EUICC, it actually means um, embedded uh, unified integrated circuit system. So it's basically the actual hardware that the eSIM, eSIM profiles are running on, right? eSIM is a term, it's a bit fuzzy. Um, what people mean, usually they mean the profiles. Um, we were focused on the consumer eSIM. There's also machine to machine, but the consumer eSIM have much more flexibility and are the most recent standards. So um, on the sort of uh, schematic level, uh, on the this is uh, should be the the actual SIM card and or the EUICC and um, uh, as you can see, it's kind of complex. I won't go to in all the details in this half an hour, but um, so basically, different security domains and their card should provide the isolation. And the eSIM is actually just one. The eSIM profile just lives in one of these. Um, domains, like for example, the green one here and separate from the red one. And then there's a special domains that uh, manage the keys uh, to deploy them and manage them and so forth. And as the end user, you shouldn't have control over any of these here, right? So, yeah. 
recap virtual profiles, you can quickly switch and they can be remotely provisioned. So um, how actually are they provisioned? Um, so there, there are multiple methods. One is uh, your device has an EID, unique ID, and the operator can't identify that, so you can pull a download server and say, hey, is there a profile for me? You can also act, uh, enter an activation code or scan a QR code which contains the activation code and um, install it like that. Or you use the store application, so there's a programmatic way like the Windows Mobile Plans app. So uh, this is an example for such a QR code, and um, yeah, the QR code could contains different information, but uh, most importantly, it contains an activation code and it contains the backend. And if you scan that QR code, then you can install it on your phone um, and uh, get the eSIM deployed, right? Mm. Including the MC and ICC ID. Um, how does it work on Windows? Because interestingly, eSIM is not only for mobile phones, but also like uh, Dell and ThinkPad models, they have also eSIM capabilities. So in Windows 10, for example, you have like, um, it started to support the mobile connectivity and you have like an app that comes with the operating system. And there can also be other uh, Metro apps, for example, that have the eSIM um, capability. So um, even eSIM profile um, does not require admin, which is very interesting for us as attackers. And uh, adversaries can yeah can use it to get out of band network access. At least that that was my idea. Uh, but yeah, we cover this later. So um, quick demo: How does this actually work? So you have like a programmatic access um, and the application. So. Um, in my Lenovo system here, for example, I have um, yeah, a mobile broadband modem and uh, it uh, comes, for example, with like this uh, in the network settings, it comes with the store app that can be accessed when you say connect with the data plan. This is just, just stock pre-installed. And yeah, if I click on that, then um, it opens the mobile plans app from Windows and it offers you like different providers. In this case, it's UBG, for example, and you can just buy an eSIM and deploy it, right? So remember I said like, what's the new attack surface? We will see soon. So like, um, yeah, this is an application and I say like, yeah, I want to actually get some connectivity. So I click on the get connectivity and I get like a new dialog and uh, can, for example, yeah, I, have, I don't know, have a UBG account. So it can say log in and boom, I guess that's the guy that reviews the Microsoft patches or so. Um, I guess, no, it's so not supposed to be like that, obviously. So what happened is that this application in the style of modern development uses a web view. So it basically loads a web page from the internet. Uh, Microsoft provides a list of trusted sites. Um, um, that, uh, yeah, that render inside of this application. Um, so in this case, yeah, there was some problem, uh, where you are, if you have a privileged network position, yeah, you can replace the content, which of course is a pretty bad thing, I think, uh, since the user has probably not, not a chance to, to see any phishing attacks, right? I could also, uh, intercept the uh, authentication. Interestingly, these sites also have the ability to, um, to install eSIM profiles unattended. So you could also install an eSIM profile. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, I didn't, of course, do anything invasive. There are like 20 of these sites. Um, of course, any kind of web vulnerability you find would compromise this store application if the users, yeah, select these operators. Um, yeah. So you see now new, uh, attack surface comes with new technology. Okay. So, um, how are these profits provisioned on the actual, let's say lower level? Um, the interesting thing is not everybody can bootstrap the, the, the eSIM profiles, but, um, it's, it's all runs over a backend, which is certified and is using, um, MTLS, but not only MTLS, inside the MTLS, there's even end-to-end -end encryption. Um, 
So you cannot really create your own eSIM profile and deploy it, right? You have to use a service that is certified by the GSMA. And of course, that's, yeah, I would say maybe good for securing and keeping control, but of course, uh, pretty bad for single researchers. So um, um, we don't even know what's inside the profile because everything's encrypted. So, yeah, uh, if you got the money and you become an operator and get certified, that's great. But what about the single researcher, right? So we want to also look into that and play around. So um, this is how it works. <laughs> uh, here, here you see the hardware, like the EU ICC. This is the actual device that contains it. And this is the backend. I won't explain all the, let's say, things. It's super complex. There's hundreds of pages of spec. Um, but basically here, this purple arrow is the end-to-end -end crypt end -end encrypted channel. And there's a daemon, the LPD, which is part of an LPA, local profit assistant, that usually runs on the device. Um, yes, so um, on, the, on the card, as I said, the EUICC is, se separates the ESIM profiles in the ISDPs, which are the isolation domains, and they can also not really talk to each other except with some special, very limited API. And um, you cannot also access files. Um, on a high level, you see this here, mobile device, you have the ISDR, which manages these profiles. There's some domain for secrets and so forth. And um, all of this comes from a backend, which is an HTTPS service on the internet usually. And um, uh, the secret keys there are contained in the in the EU ICC, they're deployed by the vendor and they're also on the back end, but yeah, in the middle you don't, shouldn't have them. Um, there's a hint that they might not be unique. So I guess if one of them leaks for a vendor, they have, they can revoke them, but um, it looks like that, yeah, certain class of devices might have the same key. Um, so, as I said, two layers of security. There's a CA preloaded um, and it's LPA on the host device only talks to the approved uh, uh, ones. So you cannot just use any CA, even if it's, let's say, trusted on Windows, for example. And then during provisioning, there's an additional end-to-end -end encryption on the profiles. And I actually, um, <laughs> which doesn't show in the talk, did a lot of reverse engineering on and tried to find some logic bugs in the protocol, right? Should be easy. But they were actually pretty okay, at least from my perspective. So um, I guess protecting the business model, um, yeah, there, there was some undertaking to secure it. So yeah, that's it, case closed. I guess I failed with the research and thanks uh, for the time. Of course not, um, because I mean, we're offensive people. We have some goals, right? We don't want to just analyze some protocol and say like, wow, it's pretty good and, and the encryption is pretty good. No, I just wanted to see like, how can I actually use this for offensive? Right. So even though the protocol is secure, can I use that to my advantage? And we could approach it in a, in a red team scenario. And so what's the goals here? Right. Um, so it's an interesting technology because um, we have our own uh, communication uh, channels. And I would show also they can run apps, these eSIMs. And is it like a phishing vector? So there's different things that we can see. And uh, we want to set some goals, and it's this kind of smart card, so if it's secure, maybe that's even great for us as an offensive person. So it's always dual use. So we do deploy a profile we fully control. That would be our goal. That would be nice, right? I said, like, it's hard, but maybe it's possible. Then do we want to install custom apps, and then maybe find some vulnerabilities or, let's say, attack, attack vectors, right? Actually, deploying the own profile is kind of easy if you spend a limited amount of money because there's some generic test profiles. And um, I mean, hacking into one of these backends is obviously illegal. And uh, as a white hat, you can't do it. But I don't know, we, we, we scanned on, uh, looked on census and there were like hundreds of these. So I don't know. I think the bad guys will probably have already compromised one of these. Huh? So, but. Um, we play by the rules so we can find some providers that allow us to deploy a test profile. And um, otherwise, of course, if you would leak the secrets in the profile provisioning, that would be catastrophic, right? So 
However, we didn't do that. We just uh, went the easy lame way. Um, we just played by the rules and bought a test certificate for provisioning. And um, um, yeah, so uh, profile is defined in ASN1. I will, will spare you the details, um, but you, the test profiles are actually open and you can see them. Um, how to deploy the test cert. Um, I will actually speed in the light of uh, light of the time. I will actually speed up that a bit. Um, so basically, you can do that by entering the activation code. On Windows, you can just uh, go to the network settings, manage eSIM settings, add a new profile, and enter the activation code or scan a QR code. I actually did that and. Then it was, uh, it will download it. So it takes a while because it's directly talking to the SIM card, sort of, uh, the protocol, encrypt, end to end encrypted protocol. And then we have the profile here. Um, so, um, now we have a profile. How can we actually use that? I mean, if we have a profile here, here, or maybe we bought one, right? We don't need to use the test profile. How can we actually use that? As I said, we wanted to have a C2 channel. So how can we actually use the eSIM for C2? Yeah, what we can do is we deploy an eSIM as non-admin users by the in default settings on Windows. And um, we just use the network connectivity or we use out-of-band channels such as SMS, right? I'm not sure if anybody works for an EDR here, but um, do you have, uh, do you intercept SMS? Anybody? No? <laughs> so, uh, the, the NS, TCP, UDP, whatever, is monitored heavily, right? However, there's a small tool developed by uh, North people at C. It's called SMS Shell. Um, I will send a link later and on the right you see basically uh, the, the client machine can be air gapped whatever and there's a client this is just a POC obviously and on the left there's a server and both of them have a mobile network connectivity on the right it's an eSIM on the left it's also an eSIM and um, yeah we just basically pack everything in SMS it's super slow super low bandwidth but it works for simple commands and you can see yeah, it's sending a lot of SMS. Um, I think we, and yeah, now it, we, we got the output of the command back. So we have a nice C2 over SMS. And I think we made some enemies at Mobile Vikings because uh, <laughs> we sent a lot of uh, SMS and they didn't like that. Uh, so they were... Uh, blocking our um, our SIM cards, so we overdid it a bit. So, but it was no no bad uh, no bad intention. We just wanted to have a demo. <laughs> so, uh, maybe you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, of course, this is a very simple implant, but we could also think about a next level implant, right? Uh, we could um, imagine using the HSM capabilities, and. Um, we could run a Java applet on the SIM, and you cannot, without the keys uh, of the of the vendor of the EUICC, you cannot really get it off the card. And that's pretty bad, I guess, for defending and for forensics, because you could put all the business logic you need a you need a stop on the operating system or on the mobile phone, but you could put all the secret business logic, whatever, on that SIM card, and that would be pretty bad. So we didn't implement that yet, but I would call it an version 2. Um, yeah, make sure you have control over the actual EUICC if you can, if you're a large organization. Um, although it's, yeah, it's really not easy to get the uh, applets off. Um, okay, so um, we're actually deploy the actual app on it. Um, uh, this is a test app, but it uses SMS. So if you have the profile installed, you can even use SMS to install a Java applet on that card remotely. And that's what we're doing here. So this is the, the EUICC, or no, this is actually the eSIM profile on the EUICC. And the good thing is that the keys 
in the generic test profile are known. Did anybody install that QR code that I shown? So for any, so no. Okay, because otherwise I could remotely manage that profile and install some apps, which I won't do, of course. Um, but uh, and of course it has to get on a mobile network. But that's possible, right? So we just install an evil applet, and um, in the wake of time, I will speed up a bit. Um, we install the evil app, and I will just in a minute show what it can do. But when we have the key, there's the over-the-air management keys, and yeah, there's also uh, admin keys to administrate the, the card's content, or, right? Um, so yeah, okay, so we could deploy the profile, we could install custom apps. So the applets can also be pre-installed if you can create your own profile. Um, we don't have control over the whole EUICC, only over that profile, the ISDP. But that's enough if it's activated to, for example, install Java applets that interact um, with the phone. Um, there's also potential for APE, of course. Um, I will skip that. It's actually not that interesting, I guess. Um, but, uh, for example, it can also be bugs in these management demons. Um, so, the SIM Toolkit is uh, quite known. And, of course, there's the capability in the SIM cards that could be done by operators, malicious operators, or attackers that got the keys. But now, as an attacker, we can also deploy an eSIM profile with these default keys and also do these funny things. And um, what these apps can do is, of course, uh, um, yeah, use all the APIs. And I will show in a minute how to do that. Um, there are different methods. Let me quickly see. Um, and what happens if I install the custom card applet? I can show here on iPhone that's iOS 16. I, I recorded that a while ago. Not sure if it still works. So we can see here, um, you should enter your passcode, right, on the lock screen. But the interesting thing is that this is actually not the dialogue from iOS, but it's instead the dialogue of um, coming from the SIM card. So the form comes from the SIM card. And um, um, that's, of course, also pretty bad because the SIM card also receives the input. And it can also do things such as sending send SMS, right? So um, um, uh, it can at any time pop up these um, dialogues. And yeah, uh, that's something that's known, but I think um, the capability was very limited. You can see here, I can also brick the phone because the SIM card can send an infinite amount of dialogues and you can never get out of it uh, until the SIM card stops. So... Um, there used to be actually um, more capabilities for doing that thing, but um, um, that's such as opening the web browser, but the uh, mobile phone vendors don't adhere to the specs, so they turned that off um, mostly. But you can still yeah, do things, start calls, send SMS, receive SMS. So your implant applets could even uh, it get SMS from remote and read them and send them out. Um, if you don't have the management keys, then they, uh, what can we do then if we don't have the management keys? Mm, we did a quick analysis of the one of the methods to authenticate to the card, because you need the keys to authenticate to the card. And one of the protocols used is SCP-02 and um, is widely used in EUICC or in card management. Um, there's also other algorithms uh, or the remote provisioning over SMS and, and so forth. Um, High-level overview, it's, it's a challenge response. And uh, um, basically, um, both the card and the host send the challenge and the response. Interestingly, the host sends the challenge first. Um, no, the card sends the challenge first, sorry. So the card sends the challenge that it has created and can check using the correct key. So... Um, a diversification aims to yeah, derive a unique key, but still, you can um, um, yeah you can offline attack that and can try to brute force that. So um, 
what we did there is we basically created a tool uh, called um, uh, Multirant. I will show the link later to attack that. Um, interestingly, for the malicious applets, the app stores are high, heavily restricted on iOS, right? But the eSIM and the SIM applications that Apple or Google cannot control, right? So if you have an applet there, it's sort of outside of the normal apps, but they still have some power on the phone. The applets are commonly developed in Java. There's a JVM on the card, and that JVM, yeah, is very limited. It's not a full JVM, but uh, yeah, you can, I don't know, this is like a Hello World applet. Uh, it's total hell to develop that because you need some super old SDK, uh, JDK, and um, a compiler and everything. Um, so that was actually the biggest challenge doing, doing that. Um, yeah, for an implant, that would be the attack chain. So you have the implant that is um, living on or uh, being like a, a C2 on the system. Um, uh, you have like the EUICC, the mobile device can, for example, talk to EUICC, forwards that to the implant, and the adversary can talk to the mobile device and also then talk to the implant, right? So that's um, quite nice because it happens sort of outside of the operating system, which would be to the right, uh, the, the application processor, the operating system. Um, Yes. Um, so there's the other commands that the applet can send. And um, um, there's uh, things refresh, uh, there's a profile download complete command, and there's display text which we shown before. And the launch browser, I don't know if it works on Android. I tried on iOS, it didn't work. Um, it also didn't work on Windows, but I wouldn't rule out that maybe I just did something wrong. And there's a ton of other commands and we wrote a little further to execute random commands and random things happened. Um, yeah. Uh, interestingly, the APD use can, the command can only send to the, from the host device. So the card cannot do that, but the card can just respond and say, hey, I, I have a new command for you. Um, I need to speed up a bit. Um, so conclusion for this one is eSIM opens a vast attack surface to research, uh, we found new applications. Uh, that, so on offensive, you can use it yeah, as uh, an attacker um, because it's actually quite secure platform where you can de deploy your evil things. Um, it also opens up attack surface for finding actual bugs, right? And um, there's so much more. So this talk was only, um, let's say, the beginning that you can you can go, you can go very deep in each of these areas, right? And, um, we could have, have been at least three talks. Um, yes. That's it. Just for a thank you and, uh, some tools. So, um, we will release this test suite applet, which is, yeah, not that, let's say, involved, but a good demo maybe, um, soon in the coming weeks. Um, there's multi rent to attack the keys which is on the X41 GitHub and there's SMS shell on the PSI GitHub. Um, so for you to download and play around with at extent and so forth. Thank you.